first, I can't believe how many people are here. And at first I just assumed you'd all come to the wrong room or I had come to the wrong room. And then I realized everybody is here to hear one person, Ratna, and to listen to the wisdom of somebody who really knows about migration, Doug, uh, and to support this amazing institution, Ryerson and the new Global Diversity Exchange. Usually if I talk, especially about anything semi-serious other than ping pong, four people show up, three of them are called Aya, and three of them have left by the first paragraph, and that may yet happen today. But of course, I'm really proud and delighted uh, to be here in this city that I've tried to claim as my adopted home for more than 20 years now, uh, and especially to help launch this exchange that speaks for so many of my most deeply held interests. But despite everything that Ratna so generously said, I feel like a real imposter and trespasser here because uh, it's not modesty or humility when I say I've never written about migration, I've never thought much about it, uh, and I've certainly never spoken about it before. Uh, and I can't tell you anything about bilateral pension agreements or remittance laws. <laughs> uh, and the one thing, of course, that is certain is that everybody in this room knows more about Tor Toronto and Canada than I do, so I will keep blessedly silent on those topics. But the one thing I thought I could offer would be a rather uninformed, non-professional, human, subjective look uh, at the world from the perspective of somebody who is a voluntary migrant, as you heard, and the son of two migrants who are both migrants twice over. As I've stumbled through a global destiny trying to make sense of this constantly shifting world and my own hybrid identity. Uh, and also, I suppose, as somebody who has much more faith in, in individuals than institutions. Uh, I think the United Nations can always pass resolutions and nobly remind us of our better angels. But I think deep down, uh, it's only as individuals that we can change our minds and refine and therefore redefine our sense of self and our sense of other. And for me, the main feature of this evening is actually the discussion that's going to follow, first with Doug and then with all of you. But uh, I have been asked to offer some dangerously broad, uh, um, unfocused provocations beforehand. Uh, and I was remembering as I was making my way over here that uh, in the third week of this new millennium, I decided to try to hijack that suddenly ubiquitous and fashionable adjective global because I felt that if globalism was really going to affect our lives, it would be at some level much deeper than frappuccinos and laptops, and that globalism would ultimately change the way we love, change the way we think, change the way we dream, and change the way we live. And I felt we were hearing so much about global markets and global communications that really what we needed to start addressing was global conscience and global responsibility and indeed global exchange. And I still believe that fervently, of course, but I never could have imagined in the third week of uh, 2000 when I brought out my book, The Global Soul, that the number of people living in countries not their own would come to 232 million already, which is greater than the entire population of Britain plus the population of France, plus the population of Italy, plus the population of Holland. And that number is increasing so quickly that those of us who live in countries where we weren't born will soon represent the third largest nation on Earth. And what struck me was that we probably spend less time thinking about this vast and quickly accelerating community than we do thinking about just Britain alone, or France alone, or Italy alone, or Holland alone. And migration is not going to go away. It's only going to become ever more a feature of our lives. And I felt that maybe the least we could do is think about it as much as we do about Facebook or the ambitions of Hillary Clinton, because it's going to shape our lives much more, I suspect, than either of those. And on a human level, I think we're all aware of how migration has changed the world unimaginably in a very, very short time. As you heard from Ratner's uh, introduction, I was born and grew up in Oxford, England. All the time I was growing up, I never saw a single other dark-skinned child. And my parents moved to California uh, when I was eight in 1965. And even then, and even there, I never saw another dark-skinned person in, in California. And I continued doing my schooling in England. 
And I still remember vividly that when I was 11, one of the most prominent politicians in Britain, Enoch Powell, predicted an apocalypse, rivers of blood, if people like me were still allowed to tread upon Britain's sacred soil. Uh, he said it was, in his words, madness, absolute madness for Britain to accept 50,000 immigrants every year. Uh, and he said that if uh, dark-skinned people came in, all the whites would leave. Uh, I remember also when I was growing up, one of the national sports of Britain was packy bashing, which was literally the beating up of anybody assumed to be Pakistani as he walked down the street. And of course, this was a somewhat ironic fate for somebody of Indian birth who'd been taught to think of Pakistan as the other. But <laughs> um, it was a reminder it's not the other. And honestly, when I was growing up, every time I walked down the street, I felt there was a good chance I would get beaten up. Uh, when I was in college in England, uh, maybe imprudently, I had a very blonde Swedish girlfriend. And people would hiss at us as we walked down the street and mutter curses when we got onto a train. And I never could have guessed then that the New York Times would be reporting more or less now that in 1958, 4% of Americans approved of mixed race marriages, by now 87% do. I never could have imagined when I was growing up near London, which then was dull as dishwater, that so quickly it would become one of the youngest, zestiest, and most international cities on the planet, whose leading writers would have names like Rushdie and Ishiguro, Mo, Qureshi, uh, whose national dish, as Doug describes wonderfully in his book, Arrival City, is something concocted by Bangladeshis in Scotland, <laughs> chicken tikka masala, uh, and most of whose sporting stars and entertainment stars are even darker than I am. Uh, and I, I'm sure many of you in this room remember the days when Toronto was known as Toronto the Grey. So uniform and white bread did it seem. And my guess is now that in certain parts of Canada it's referred to as Toronto the Black just because it's so rainbow colored. And I think all of us in a room like this know that tribalism is not going to go away. In fact, it, in many cases, seems to be intensified and to increase in the face of migration. And it seems there's almost something in human nature that as soon as certain divisions and walls disappear, we feel the need to replace them with new ones. And it's almost as if it's very hard for us to define a we without thinking about a they. Uh, I just read that uh, certain researchers have found that it takes the average human being 170 milliseconds, less than that, when he meets somebody new to work out if it belongs to his group or another group. Uh, and of course, if you take a group of ants and you put them in a box, the very first thing they do is to create a colony. Uh, the second thing they do is to create a cemetery. Uh, <laughs> and yet, when I'm in Toronto and when I'm at Ryerson, I think that as cities, as universities, as countries, and as individuals, most of us, and I think this applies to many, many people here looking around, are made up of pieces of many, many different places. And in fact, we know too well that we can't be squeezed into any of the old categories and divisions. And I think this actually allows us to define ourselves perhaps in much more imaginative and open-ended ways than we did before. Even as a little boy, I realized that if I were to call myself Indian, perhaps I would be tempted to think of Pakistan as the enemy. If I were to define myself in the 60s as an American, maybe I would think of Cuba or Vietnam as evil empires. If uh, I were tempted to brand myself as British, many members of Britain's former colonies might rightly see me as an oppressor. But maybe I thought I could define myself more by my passions than my passports. And as somebody of the relatively privileged class, treat home not as something that's inherited as our parents are, but something that's chosen as our partners are. And in redefining myself, maybe I could step a little beyond the grievances and age-old vicious cycles of my grandparents' world. So if I define myself as somebody who loves Thai food and likes to spend time uh, in airports with my tourist visa uh, and can't get enough of the Icelandic group Sigur Rós, maybe I would be stepping into a less divisive sense of us versus them, and one that was much, much less polarizing. Indeed, if I were to define myself by my circumstances, I have much, much more in common with a Pakistani in Toronto than apart from him. And of course, 
Serious questions remain about belonging and political accountability and how those of us who live in many places will be responsible to anyone. But I've always felt that human nature is very, very difficult to change. But the way we look at it and the way that we work with it can be altered and transformed or um, purified at any moment. Uh, when I was a, a young man, I spent eight years of my life studying nothing but literature, not a single hour of history or social sciences or languages or science, which is one reason why I'm so ill-qualified to talk about migration. But um, I remember in those days, some of you may remember, that studying literature meant studying Dickens and Hardy and a woman called Eliot and a man called Eliot. And I never would have guessed then that a few years later, the Booker Prize, given to the single strongest novel to come out of Britain and the Commonwealth, never ever seemed to go to somebody from Britain. Every year, it was won by somebody from South Africa or Australia or India or, of course, Canada. And you in Canada, I'm guessing in the mid to late 80s, probably noticed that your story was now being written by people with names like Mystery and Ondaatje and Skvoreki. Uh, the US is always, of course, a lot slower to catch on. But uh, by now, even in the US, uh, a typical young American novelist, I think, has a name that most typical young Americans can't pronounce, uh, like Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, or Jhumpa Lahiri, or Edwige Dontika, or Yiyun Li, just to name some of the, the women writers, who are bringing into the American mainstream stories and histories and ways of telling history that have never been encountered before, and are essentially rewriting America with spices and rhythms and sounds that used to belong to the furthest corners of the world. A new kind of writer is arising to speak to and for a new kind of reader. And my sense is that when a young Vietnamese woman writes about the rift in her household between migrant parents who associate themselves with the country they've left and children who are eager to identify with the country where they've arrived, her story speaks instantly to a Cuban or a Somali or a Bangladeshi or a Russian. Uh, and on a cultural level, I think we're all aware of how migrants have remade the world for the better, whether it's world music, world literature, fusion, cuisine. And one thing that fascinates me is that even the person who is unsettled by the other, somebody, let's say, who lives in Toronto, never wants to uh, leave Ontario, is still resident in his grandmother's house, every time he goes down the street to Tim Hortons, is surrounded by the spouses of South Asia and the sounds of Creole and the customs and costumes of Somalia. So even that person who thinks he has a very fixed identity has to rethink who he is and where he belongs or else he won't be able to survive in the modern world. Inside and outside center and margins have completely exploded. I think in some respects we are all migrants now. And just as Le Monde famously wrote in, on September 12, 2001, we are all Americans, I think at some level now we are all minorities. Uh, as I say, this doesn't, I think, mean that we're living in a small, small world, uh, unless we're in Disneyland. Um, as you've heard, I, I have to travel a lot for my job, and I've been traveling almost without cease since I was nine years old, so uh, almost half a century. And my experience is that the world is not becoming homogeneous and it's not becoming flat, that if anything, the differences and dis dis distances between cultures are growing greater than ever before, partly because of the illusion of familiarity and closeness. That, of course, is why the United States has such problems with North Korea, even though when I returned to North Korea eight months ago, I was reminded that its leaders are in love with Disneyland and NBA basketball and McDonald's and James Bond. Uh, that's why Washington can't see eye to eye with Tehran, even though when I was walking the streets of Isfahan about 18 months ago, every shop seemed to be projecting an LED ad for PlayStation 3 uh, or Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. And Every other book in the stores was a copy, no doubt pirated, of Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs. Um, all of you, I think, know what a distance still separates Toronto, probably from many parts of rural Ontario, uh, a distance of centuries as well as of cultures. And I think we often use the phrase global village because it's an inherently consoling phrase. It suggests village elders gathered around a village green passing down the wisdom of their forefathers. And in certain ways, I think we're living more in a global city. 
whose soundtrack is not a soothing folk lullaby, but gangster rap or hip hop, and can resemble the South Bronx blown up to the size of a planet where different tribes are fighting it out for preeminence. Uh, as all of you know, when the 19th century began, 3% of humans lived in cities. By now, it's 50%, and it's growing by the second. 1.3 million human beings move into a city every week. And if you read Doug's uh, really brilliantly reported and original book, A Rival City, it will probably change the way you think about all of this. It certainly changed the way I think about slums and favelas, which many people attempted to see as excrescences on the face of the global megacity, but which, as he beautifully points out, are places of energy, places of aspiration, places of hope, and places of transition. Nonetheless, I think if it takes a village to raise a child, as Hillary Clinton has suggested, it probably takes a global village to unsettle one. And um, even when I brought out my book on globalism in the year 2000, one American individual had the same net worth as 100 million of his compatriots in that rather affluent country. And three American individuals had the same net worth as 48 nations on the planet. And of course, we all know those inequities have only intensified in the 15 years since. So we may all be on the same page, but so many of us are in the margins. I nonetheless do have faith in the future. And I remember eight years ago, I was in a really rickety burger joint in the North Shore of Oahu in Hawaii with a writer friend. <clears throat> And at the next picnic table, there were about 15 or 16 people, uh, mostly in flip-flops and T-shirts and shorts. Uh, and some of them looked to be Asian American, and some of them looked to be African American, and some looked to be fresh combinations of the two. <coughs> and at the center of the table was a skinny teenager, as he seemed, who was going to collect avocado burgers and napkins for everybody else. And at one point, my friend said to me, do you see who's at the next table? Um, as you heard, I live in rural Japan, so I didn't know who it was. Uh, he said, that's this guy, Barack Obama. And they say he's going to enter the presidential race next week. We've got to go and talk to him. <laughs> and I said, well, of course, the reason he's come to this derelict burger joint is to get away from the likes of you and me and the prospect of being interrupted. But my friend, being a writer, wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> so we burst in on poor Mr. Obama in the middle of his private family lunch. And he sprang up, he knew all my friend's books, he knew all my books, he knew every single book we mentioned, and we had the most sparkling literary conversation you could ever have with a stranger interrupted on the street. Uh, I happened to hear him on the campaign trail uh, 16 months later, and of course, everything about him was different. Uh, understandably, in order to present himself as a man of the, the people, he acted as if he'd never heard of a book, he was dropping all the Gs in his gerunds, and he you know, was sounding like a very, very different person, as most politicians do. But it reminded me that for those of us who have the benefit of being many-homed, of course, one of the challenges is that you do have a face and a voice and a self to present to every circumstance. And it can be hard to find a single sustained, consistent direction amidst the many people and places inside you. But nonetheless, I never could have guessed, even 10 years ago, I think, that the most powerful man on the planet officially would be half Kenyan, half Kenzan, raised in Indonesia with a Buddhist sister and a Chinese Canadian brother-in-law. And least of all, could I have imagined that maybe the most searching look at being the son of a migrant, at identity, and the quest for a new kind of synthetic home would come from the principal occupant of the White House. I think Dreams from My Father is the most honest, passionate, and intelligent book on identity that I've encountered. And of course, Mr. Obama describes unflinchingly what it's like to be perhaps too black for Kansas and too American for Kenya, but he also intimates that when he meets a half Jamaican, half English person, Malcolm Gladwell, sometimes of Canada, or Zadie Smith, he may have more in common with them than with anyone entirely of Kansas or Kenya. And this whole new community is forming of people who live between the cracks and um, in all kinds of unforeseen ways. And I do think Mr. Obama's place in office speaks for some of the promise of North America. I'm guessing it'll be quite a long time before we see a half Kenyan as head of state in Britain or France or Holland. Uh, again, when uh, Washington entered a war with radical Islam 20 years ago, I never could have imagined that the single most popular poet in the United States for each of the last 20 years 
would be an Islamic poet, uh, a 14th century mystic, Rumi. And I firmly believe that when Rumi arrives in Santa Monica, much of him is lost in translation, is misunderstood, uh, or is distorted. But nonetheless, this Islamic poet is somehow speaking to Americans in a way that Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson and even Shakespeare um, are not. And I've noticed over the 21 years I've been coming to Toronto, pretty much every year, that the one thing you don't like in this city and country is being complimented. And of course, that's one of the main things I'd like to compliment you on, because um, <laughs> modesty and self-deprecation aren't always so easily found south of the border. Uh, but to some extent, I think everybody in this room can tell me um, about things that are going wrong in Toronto and Canada, and all the things that are imperfect. I was just reading an article about how suspicion of visible minorities and racism is reaching peaks that haven't been seen since 1993. And on my way over here, talking to some of you, I loved the fact that the word you were all using was vigilant. You achieve so much, but you're vigilant because you know those achievements can be undermined in a second. But nonetheless, every time I come to Toronto and I hear these useful challenges to your home country, I ask my friends here, which country in the world is looking at globalism more consciously, more searchingly, and more honestly than Canada? Australia, of course, has some of the same circumstances. It's a wide open country that's taken in many, many migrants. But nonetheless, whenever I'm there, I am reminded that in my lifetime, not so long ago, its leading newspaper came out above the banner, uh, Australia for the White Man. Uh, South Africa has some of the same conditions, but as you all know, it has one of the five highest murder rates in the world. Uh, Singapore has created a beautifully clean, efficient, extraordinarily impressive multiculture, but I would say at a great price to individual freedom. And as the other would-be Canadian, William Gibson, has put it, it can still look like Disneyland with the death penalty. Um, <laughs> Hong Kong and Dubai have created these very successful entrepot uh, based on the unities of the marketplace. But I think if you speak to a Filipina nanny there or a Sri Lankan laborer, you might get a less rosy picture. Uh, Europe has been haunted for 800 years by the image of barbarians at the gates. Uh, and if the US doesn't know how behind it is, that's only because 64% of Americans don't have passports and don't want to look at anything outside the US. Uh, somebody recently suggested to me that Sweden and New Zealand offer great possibilities. New Zealand is one of the most pleasant places you could go, but it's a quarter the size of Ontario. So it's dealing with very different circumstances. Sweden, as reported only last week in the New York Times book review, has a very prominent anti-immigrant party, and people like me are not always that welcome there. So I've got to admit, whenever I'm in some really interesting place and I hear an American voice, I say, excuse me, are you from Toronto or Vancouver? <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm so glad that institutes like this global um, diversity exchange exist um, because, well, I was going through the guest list of this evening beforehand and it seemed 40%, 70% of the people here are involved in di diversity issues or diaspora issues or um, issues about multicultural banking I just ran into, which is a phrase I'd never heard of before. And I do think in these accelerating days, um, a difficult question is much more useful than a too simple answer. And I think one of the things I love about GDX's name is the X in it, reminding us that migration is a two-way street. And it's very easy for us to think about the effects of migration on Vancouver or New York City or London, but it's so easy to forget how it's transforming the countries that are left behind. Uh, and of course, on the one hand, they're getting remittances, they're getting contact with the developing world, uh, they're getting a new sense of opportunity, but on the other hand, they're losing their loved ones, they're losing many of their most qualified people, and nowadays, for the enterprising young person in South India or South China, the sites are set not on Bombay University or Beijing University, but Ryerson and the University of Toronto and Harvard and, and Bay Street and Silicon Valley. Uh, and I, by chance, just two weeks ago, was talking to a cardiologist. And not having had this opportunity often, I asked him which places in the world he thought of at the best medical training. And he said, well, he thought India was really, really good at producing physicians, but in the very next sentence, he said 1,400 Indian physicians a day are coming into the United States. In other words, it's producing wonderful physicians and then losing them to a brain drain. 
And even somebody like myself is a bit of an example of that, insofar as I'm of entirely of Indian origin, as you heard. And I didn't find it that hard to adapt to Britain or to the United States or to Japan, but I think I might not know what to do if suddenly I was presented with India. And <laughs> so I haven't been there very often. Uh, and since I've been talking exclusively about migration on the cultural and individual rather than the geopolitical level, I thought I might bring this towards an, a close by talking about perhaps one of the most visible migrants in the world, uh, whom I've been lucky enough to be talking and traveling with for more than 40 years. And I think one of the reasons I really like and admire the Dalai Lama is that, of course, when he comes to Toronto or Sydney or Paris, he tells everybody not to become Buddhists. He is an anti evangelist. And he tells people that many of us may have things to learn from Buddhism. Buddhists surely have things to learn from us. But he always reminds us of not to claim too quickly an identity that isn't ours or that we are failing fully to understand. And I think that arises out of his 30 years of constant travel in which he has seen firsthand how much a gap still remains between cultures that assume that they're speaking the same language. I think one of the other things I admire about him is that he freely admits that when he was a young man growing up in Lhasa, Tibet, he actually believed that Buddhism was the greatest religion on earth because he hadn't been exposed to any other. And then he came out into the wider world and met Muslims and Christians and Hindus and Sikhs and maybe especially conscience-driven, really responsible scientists who proudly told him they had no interest in any religion whatsoever. And he saw that each of those traditions has a beauty. His most recent book is called Beyond Religion and it's about what lies in the purview uh, of further than any religious doctrine, but is most urgent for any human life. Uh, and he actually likens religions now to medical systems and says it's a great thing that we have so many of them because different bodies respond differently to different systems. Some bodies respond best to acupuncture, some to Ayurveda, some to Western medicine, so he feels with religion. And before last November, each of the previous eight Novembers, he'd come to Japan, and my wife and I had traveled right next to him for every hour of his working day as he went across Japan for seven to 10 days each year. And so, of course, we had lunch with him every day and we attended all his public events, but we also got to sit in on every private meeting he held with old friends and scientific leaders and other religious leaders and heavy metal musicians and the like. <laughs> and uh, every time, almost, he would tell people that by virtue of being a migrant, he had been able to do so much he ne never could have done if surrounded by the formalized ritualism of old Tibet. For example, he's given many new, new opportunities to the women in the Tibetan community to become abbots that they never had in Tibet and probably wouldn't have if they were still in Tibet. He has brought the English language and Western science into his monk's curriculum. Most of all, having seen India and the US and Canada and so many other countries, he's brought democracy to his people for the first time in their history. And as you remember, he uh, politically deposed himself four years ago and said, you are my ruler rather than the other way round. And of course, the Dalai Lama is not a typical migrant, but he would emphasize that he is a typical human being. And that like all the rest of us, he is the product not of his circumstances, but of what he does with those circumstances. So I think just to conclude, my feeling is that it's up to migrants, we migrants, to look unswervingly at reality and find the possibility hidden inside it. And it's up to those people who have lived all their lives in the same country to understand that their reality has changed and they can't afford to define themselves the way they did in the past. And I think everybody in Canada knows about some of the shadow sides of migration. I think on the streets of Vancouver, different gangs from different parts of the world fight it over for the drug trade and innocent people get lost in the middle. Uh, some second generation migrants here perhaps in the absence of a given identity, affiliate themselves very strongly with the most extremist groups back at home that they probably would have had no interest in if they were still back in their former home. And again, the consequences are felt among regular people, so to speak, here in, in Canada. Uh, you all know that 41% uh, of uh, the chronically poor migrants in this country are actually have university degrees, and they face prejudice, and they have to endure homesickness. And well, I talked briefly about some of the problems that the arrival cities have and some of the problems that the departure countries have, but as we all know, even the passage between homes is perilous. Uh, 
32,000 people are displaced from their homes every day, and the average refugee spends 17 years in exile. And uh, as Ratner implied earlier, up to 20,000 people have been lost just in the Mediterranean in the past 20 years. And in the past four weeks, we've heard of incident after incident uh, to the point where 1,600 have died in the first four months of this year, which is 30 times more dying on that perilous passage than died in the same period last year. And because I spend a lot of my time in California and Japan, which to me seem like gated communities, unreal places of privilege, very far from the circumstances of most of our global neighbors, a few years ago, I decided to spend maybe four years going around all the poorest countries in different corners of the globe, from Haiti to Bolivia to Yemen to Ethiopia to Cambodia to Easter Island and many, many more. And anybody who has been to Yemen, which to me is the most broken, desperate, lawless, aching place that I've ever seen, has to think again when you hear that Somalis are trying to migrate into Yemen and try to imagine what Somalia must be like if Yemen looks preferable. So, I think one of the things that finally prom promised to close this, that I also admire so much about the GDX is, as Ratna said, it's not just a think tank, it's a think and do tank, and it's about action. And I think that action takes two forms that I can think of, legislation and perception. Uh, I've been lucky enough to go to three TED Talks in the last two years, so I've heard about 200 presentations. And I would say the single most memorable, perhaps, came from a World Bank economist who pointed out, as most of us hadn't known, that remittances, money sent back from migrants to their home countries, represent three times more money sent around the world than foreign aid. Beyond that, they're targeted. They are going to people waiting and ready to make the most use of it. They are not likely to be siphoned off by corrupt leaders or corrupt institutions at the top. And he was just saying, everybody gains from remittances. All we need is international cooperation so as to make this process easier. And countries of the developed and the developing world will all be better off. And in terms of perception, um, I think in some ways we have to acknowledge what Simone Weil wrote in a very different context years ago, which is um, that we must take the feeling of being at home into exile. We must be rooted in the absence of a place. And I always remember, as a student of literature, that moment in Shakespeare's Tempest when Miranda sees the first migrants she's ever seen, the uh, somewhat drunken Milanese who have arrived on her island. And she sees them and she gasps and says, a brave new world that has such people in it. To which her much older father, Prospero, very aware of all the chicaneries and brutalities of the Milan he's fled, says dryly, it is new to thee. <laughs> it's not so new at all. And I think our job, in some ways, is to combine the hopefulness of Miranda with the realism of Prospero. And as it is, we feel unconsciously so many of the challenges of migration. I think the least we can do is to consciously make the most of their strengths. So thank you so much for all listening so quietly. And now we get Doug at last. <laughs>